thank you, Santa. Kind of introduction. And uh, thank you all for coming back to this room after your lunch. I was afraid of the case that no, no audience is here, but there are so many people, as much, uh, as much more than I expected. My talk today will focus on technology transfer. And uh, the, the first topic is titanium dioxide photocatalysis. I have been working with functional materials for a long, long time, nearly 40 years, and uh, studied in various fields, like uh, molecular-based magnet, microbial energy production, or um, uh, artificial photosynthesis, or something like that. But the reason why I chose here today is that uh, this work was most successful from the viewpoint of technology transfer. And uh, even now that the market is expanding based on our very recent uh, research result. And then, so title is interesting, from the composition of cockroach to industry. You will know soon the reason of this title. And then the second is a technology transfer example of NIMS, where I belong now. And, uh, we, uh, and uh, we start collaboration, new joint research collaboration with WINS. That's why I will, if I have time, time is left, I want to introduce such a collaboration program. OK, let me start with the first topic, titanium dioxide. This cartoon shows the schematic, uh, cartoon shows the um, guide, um, working principle of semiconductor photocatalysis. Probably most of you may know the, such a simple picture. The, by the band irradiation, the valence band electron is excited to the conduction band. And this conduction band electron can reduce the adsorbed species. And whole accept the electron of adsorbed molecules, meaning that the the oxidation reaction proceeds. So important point is that we have to excite this, the semiconductor with, by the, end and the photons with energy rather than band gap. The most famous uh, semiconductor photocatalyst is the titanium dioxide, which I'm going to talk today. The band gap of titanium dioxide is three electron volt, meaning that uh, for the uh, right wavelengths shorter than 400 nanometer is necessary. So UV light is necessary. And another important point, important characteristic of titanium dioxide is this deep valence band, meaning the photo, photo excited, photo produced hole has very, very strong oxidation power, very strong. However, it is limited by the number of photons, of course. And this is the market growth of titanium dioxide photocatalyst product in Japan. It started around 1995. Now it is around uh, 700, 800 million US dollars per year, something like that. But as I said, it is now start expanding. I'll tell you later. But anyway, this market was built, probably, I can say that due to our work. So history of photocatalysis, photocatalytic hydrogen production from water will be explained briefly. Very famous Honda Fujishima effect. This is the first report, it is said, that of the artificial photosynthesis, this photoelectrochemistry. They used the titanium dioxide as an anode and the platinum electrode as a cathode. By the elimination of titanium dioxide and anode, the photo, the photo, and photo excited electron is transferred to the platinum cathode, producing hy um, hydrogen. And on the titanium dioxide side, the water is ox uh, oxidized, producing oxygen. So the water is 
they decomposed into both hydrogen and oxygen. So this is the first example of the artificial photosynthesis. So then you can know that external circuit is not necessary. That's why everybody recognized that, that they, okay, when we have titanium nanoparticles the sur and its surface is platinized, then similar reaction will occur. Illumination of titan platinized titanium dioxide with UV light will produce hydrogen and oxygen. And this is long time ago, more than 40 years ago, 50, nearly 50 years ago, but it didn't work. In the 70s, many researchers in the world tried this reaction, but it, it, it didn't work. And uh, in 1980, that's the time when I graduated and I joined this, the, in, this group and Institute for Molecular Science in Okazaki, Professor Sakata and Kawai's group, very small group, only two people there, and I'm the third person. They are working on this platinum titanium dioxide photocatalytic reaction. And uh, I'm, the, I, I'm not the expert, so only I listen to their discussion. They discussed, they discussed why it didn't work. It should work, but actually no hydrogen, no oxygen detected. Why? And then they come to the conclusion, they came to the conclusion, this is nanoparticle, that's why the reaction site and oxygen site are the situated very closely. That's why back reaction will proceed. Even if hydrogen and oxygen produced, the back reaction to the water proceed. Okay, then they got the idea, what they need is hydrogen. What they need is hydrogen, not necessarily oxygen. So why don't we add organic compound here? Because balance band hole has so strong oxidation power, that's why balance band hole will oxidize the organic compound to CO2. And CO2 and, water, CO2 and hydrogen does not react at the room temperature. So I clearly remember that time. They discussed like that, and I watched, I listened to their talk. Okay, add some organic compound. What organic compound they have? Okay, they use such a flask. In the flask, water and the platinum titanium dioxide in. So we looked for something in the laboratory. So what we found is, yes, everybody has the washing bottle. And put the ethanol, then many, many bubbles start being produced violently. I was really shocked. Many people worked for a long, long time. And uh, you know, the ethanol washing bottle, everybody has. And add ethanol, a small amount, the situation changed drastically. Actually, such a reaction occurs. The organic compound ethanol is decomposed and water is reduced. So, OK, it works. Why don't we try the organic compounds? There are many, many organic compounds in the laboratories. Almost all worked. Even the urine, instead of pure water, it worked. It contains organic compound producing hydrogen. Really surprised. And uh, OK, so it's really any type of organic, any waste, organic waste can be used as a source of hydrogen. OK, really, we are excited. And why I worked very hard. And that, was, that work attracted many people's attention, not only the scientists, but also the, you know, the many, many magazines, newspapers, TVs, or some, something like that. And this work was reported. But I kept only one journal, magazine, this one. This is Playboy magazine in Japan. Okay. And what it says is photocatalysis will solve world energy crisis. Because you know that the organic waste can be used. And what it says here is you can't read, so I saw I write. Okay. Even a cockroach was decomposed producing hydrogen. 
It says, actually, it's true. In the pure water, it doesn't work. But when we put the cockroach into the flask, hydrogen starts being produced, really. And the cockroach was completely decomposed. But it took a long, long time, two years, with a very strong UV light. OK, keep this UV light intensity, 20 milliwatt per square centimeter. That's very strong UV light. And two years. But anyway, cockroach was completely decomposed. Wow. Really? And so, ah, that, by the way, this is me. <laughs> I was young. Long, long time ago. OK. So however, it, it had 30 years have passed. But uh, photocatalysis, no, 40 years, maybe 40, that was 1980. So 40 years have passed, but uh, photocatalysis has not solved the energy crisis yet. Why? The average UV light intensity in solar energy is about one million Pascal centimeter. OK, so for, we use a big, huge uh, Fresnel lens and uh, illuminated, the bo bottle is illuminated for one week. Huge amount of hydrogen was produced. The quantity is huge, but how much it is? The hydrogen obtained in one week is only one cent. That was really disappointed. And this one can be calculated very easily. It takes only one minute. But we haven't done such a calculation for two years. Not only us, but nobody did such a calculation. So I spent two years for such an experiment. Decompose the organic compound, decompose of urine or something like that. OK. So then I learned such a rough estimation is really important when we think about real, real application. It's a very simple calculation, you understand. But the amount of hydrogen is so big, so much, that's why that impressed us. And nobody calculate. Something like that. OK, I learned energy density of sunlight is very low. And hydrogen, hydrogen is obtained from fossil fuel that is very cheap, very cheap. This was the time when I was 24 or 25 years old, when I was young. I was very much impressed with these things. And I stopped such application-oriented research at all. And then I did the very basic research at the, the electron transfer process of the solid and unsolved molecule or something like that. OK. So I worked in such a field for six, seven years. But uh, I moved to the University of Tokyo as a lecturer in 1989. The University of Tokyo is famous for this red gate named Akamon, very historical red gate. Very nice historical things. I was in the chemistry building. In the chemistry building, toilet was really dirty. <laughs> Something like that <laughs> at that time. Then, it's me. I got the idea. We could decompose a cockroach. Why don't we decompose a bacteria? I knew at that time the, the such, you know, the, such a dirty toilet is due to the bacteria. Bacteria eat the component of urine and producing some, you know, something that is colored. That's why we, we, if we can kill bacteria, then we can keep the toilet clean. That's the that idea I got. OK, so this is the AFM picture of bacteria on titanium dioxide surface. The size of bacteria is one micron, two micron, or something like that. And the UV light intensity in this case is one milliwatt per square centimeter. This one is one, the average out outdoors UV light intensity. For one, after one day, one day irradiation, 
it seems not to be changed, but actually when we see carefully, the outer membrane we can see here, it is not disappeared. So outer membrane is already decomposed. Keeping the illumination, after six days, illumination disappeared. OK, let us calculate again. When we decompose the cockroach, it took two years with a light intensity of 20 milliwatt, 20 times higher. OK, so light intensity is 20, 20 times higher. The time period of irradiation is, OK, this is six days. And for the decomposition of cockroach, it took two years, 700, so 100 times. The total amount of photons introduced here is 2,000 times less than the case of cockroach. Let's say that the thickness of bacteria is a micron. And we use a very small cockroach that is several millimeter. <laughs> OK several thousand times, so it's reasonable. This is a photochem photochemical reaction. That's why it is proportional to the number of photons introduced. That's very clear. So it clearly says that the UV light intensity, one milliwatt square centimeter, corresponds to about 10 to 15 photons per second. From the viewpoint of energy, energy density is very low. But the number of photons is large, not small. Number of photons means that the, when we see the things from the nanometer scale or molecular level, that is enough, it says. So oh, that's why, oh, sorry. So I got the idea that uh, when we call to various things, when we call to various things, and illuminate with the, you know, the very weak UV light, some dirt or bacteria will be decomposed, even without irradiation of strong UV light. So the idea was to coat various substrate with titanium dioxide. But it was not so easy, because titanium dioxide has so strong oxidation power, that's why the conventional binder, organic binder, will be easily decomposed by photocatalytic reaction. That's why we have to have the inorganic binder. And depending on the substrate, we have to control the composition of binder. So from technological point of view, such as the, the, the development of the binder is very difficult, very important. So we start collaboration with various companies. So first, I call TOTO. Toto is uh, the sanitary company, ceramic company, biggest ceramic company in Japan. I called, it's not me, but the cold. Yeah. We could have clean toilet. Yes, we started the collaboration. But the toilet is used indoor, and UV light intensity in indoor is a thousand times less than outdoors. So it didn't work. It didn't work. However, the idea that uh, coat the outdoor building materials like ceramics, glasses, photo, uh, poly, polyvinyl fabric, plastic, metal, something like that with titanium dioxide by using, as I told, proper the, uh, the method by the, such a active titanium dioxide dispersed in a binder, in the proper binder and the coat, then we can have transparent film. Then export outdoors. Outdoors light intensity is one milliwatt per square centimeter. That's why it works. OK, this is experiment, simple experiment. Left hand side is titanium dioxide coated. Right hand side is conventional substrate. And illuminate with one milliwatt square centimeter, typical light intensity. So this is the, the blue colored organic compound and uh, illuminate with one milliwatt, so exposed outdoors. Then this is two minutes after, four minutes, six minutes, 
eight minutes, 10, 12, 40 minutes, okay, disappears like that. So if we expose this one as those, that will be decomposed. Okay, that can be used. But, uh, okay, so when we code various substrates with such a transparent act photoactive titanium dioxide, exposed outdoors, such a photo-induced decomposition occurs even without additional artificial light source. Okay, only the usual outdoor condition is enough when sunlight is shining, sun is shining. But uh, this does not include any new science. You know. It is known that the titanium dioxide has such a strong oxidative power, and simply we find, I find a way to utilize such a titanium dioxide. No science at all. But science is very interesting. During this experiment, I recognize something strange happens. That is, I don't tell the details, but uh, this is the, the uh, picture of water droplet. Left hand side is before illumination, right hand side is after illumination. You know that before the illumination, water droplets contact angle, which, which is explained, it was explained clearly yesterday. And uh, you know, the, that is about 30 degrees or something like that for conventional titanium dioxide coated materials. But after illumination, contact angle becomes zero, zero degree. Superhydrophilic in this case, not superhydrophobic. Superhydrophilic state is obtained by weak UV light illumination. And such a state, hydrophilic state, is maintained even without illumination for several hours or several tens of hours and return to the original situation gradually. Okay, <laughs> this can be simply explained by Young's equation, which uh, yesterday it is clearly explained. So I don't tell the details, but this is very classical uh, simultaneous equation. And this is the balance of the surface tension or surface energy of surface energy of uh, at the interface of solid air, solid water, and water and air. So contact angle theta is determined by the balance of this surface free energy or surface tension, interface tension. Okay. And uh, this gamma SL, gamma SL is the surface free energy at the interface of water and solid can be approximated by surface tension of gamma S and gamma L, like this. So the Contact angle is a function of the ratio of surface free energy of solid and liquid. And liquid is the water and the air, water air, the interface is constant. That's why this can be easily expressed like that. The cosine C, the contact angle is a function of the surface free energy of titanium dioxide as the interface of titanium dioxide and air. So experimental results shows theta is decreasing by UV light. So it means that the surface free energy, gamma S, is increasing. In other words, surface becomes unstable by the light illumination. And the, such a state is maintained for tens of hours or something like that several hours to 10, 10 hours, and return, oh, return slowly, gradually, to the original one. OK, so UV light illumination changes the surface, titanium dioxide surface, into metastable state. I don't explain the details, so only the, the, our conclusion is shown here. What we, based on the various experimental data, we propose this mechanism. The light illumination creates electron and holes, and electron is consumed by reacting with oxygen. Then hole decomposes titanium dioxide itself. Then water 
is dissociably adsorbed, forming OH species on the surface. So the concentration of hydroxide, hydroxide on the surface is increased, increased by the light illumination. And this one is a metastable state. That's why it goes back. So this mechanism we proposed. And first, it, it was accepted. But then the many people against it, our proposal. Researchers from surface, uh, surface scientists. Because our experiment was done under the ambient conditions. When we, they said that when we talk about the surface, we have to have the ultra vacuum conditions. OK. And, uh, but I said, our experiment is done under ambient condition. So the situation is different. So we had a big argument. And uh, for, from 2000, 2002 to 2009, our paper, all, any of our paper was not any of our papers not accepted. <laughs> yeah. And actually, finally, after 2009, many experimental data was reported that actually our mechanism is correct. So now it is approved. It is accepted in the community, I think. But anyway, such a, a new mechanism we found. And, but, uh, in addition to such a mechanism, more important, more interesting is applications. OK, this is a uh, photo of the uh, oil droplet colored red on the substrate. The injury, this is a conventional substrate without titanium dioxide. And this plate is slightly tilted. And uh, water is coming from the top. This is a conventional substrate. Oil is sticked on the surface. But when we have the titanium dioxide coated one, then you can see oil is moving. What happens? I can show the side view from now on. OK, this is a conventional one. Oil sticks on the surface. But in the case of titanium dioxide, after illumination, surface becomes so hydrophilic, that's why okay, water comes in between oil and substrate. That's why oil is washed out. So then it gives us a new application. OK, left hand side is the coated with titanium dioxide and exposed to the exo exhausted gas. And with the water, OK, so such a dirty you know, species are easily washed out by water. Of course, we can decompose by the right, right illumination by photocatalytic reaction, but it takes time. We need a rather long time illumination. But in this case, we don't need the light illumination. OK, once it is illuminated, such a hydrophilic state, highly hydrophilic state is maintained for more than several hours or 10 hours, something like that. Like that. So if we expose this substrate outdoors, then the surface is always so hydrophilic, super hydrophilic. So by combining both, this uh, the easy cleaning washed by rainwater. So by both photocatalytic decomposition reaction and photoinduced hydrophilic reactions, the titanium dioxide coated material keeps clean when we expose outdoors. And the paint, fabric, glass, pet film, even the pet film we develop the, you know, the, the binders. So we have such a, the transparent binders on, and motor and even the cars. So this is a new business. And the photocatalysis industry was established in Japan. That 
these buildings use our system. The, this is the Maranouchi building in front of Tokyo Station. Okay, this is the main gate of Tokyo Station. This fabric is coated with titanium dioxide. That's why the white color is kept for long, all like that. And uh, cricket stadium in Dubai, and also football stadium in Dallas is also the, uh, coated with our titanium dioxide. Roppongi Midtown grasses and uh, Pompidou Center's roof or something like that. So this is used all over the world now. It's really happy to see that the technology, what I developed, is used in a, such a large scale. That's very really happy to see. And the toilet and the chemistry building of the University of Tokyo is clean now. So photocatalysis application has not been developed under such a present conditions. So dirty toilet is sometimes helping the research. <laughs> okay, titanium dioxide photocatalysis only active for UV light, and the UV light intensity outdoor is enough, as I told, but indoor is not enough. That's why we have to have the visible light sensitive photocatalyst. Okay, that is the Next topic. So as I told, band gap of titanium dioxide, 3 eb. We need a UV light. To utilize the visible light, we have to narrow the band gap. To narrow the band gap, there are two ways. One is uh, lower the conduction band. The other one is raise the bar balance band. Okay. When lower the conduction band, the reduction power is decreased. And the electrons, excited electron, in our case, is consumed by reaction, by reacting with oxygen. And the reduction potential, one electron reaction potential of oxygen is located very close to this conduction band position. That's why when we lower the conduction band, it doesn't work anymore. That's why Almost all the work to have the visible light sensitive titanium dioxide is focused on the raising the, the balance band. But when we raise the balance band, oxidation power is decreased. As I told, most important character, character of titanium dioxide is strong oxidation power. That's why to have the visible light sensitive means to sacrifice the oxidation power titanium dioxide. That's why it is not used so well. About 10 years ago, more than, a little bit more than 10 years ago, we found, I don't tell the details, I don't tell the details today, but uh, when the titanium dioxide uh, surface is the grafted with divalent copper or trivalent iron nanocluster, like this, this is five nanometer, and this is a, a divalent copper case, so two, three nanometers, like this. Then we have the new absorption invisible light. Absorption, this one, is a DD transition, so it doesn't work. But this one is a new band appears by, the, by introducing divalent copper or trivalent iron nanocluster on titanium dioxide. And when we illuminate this band, Okay, this is the composition of acetaldehyde. When acetaldehyde is completely decomposed, two CO2 molecules are produced. And this is a complete decomposition, the concentration. Okay, in the case of divalent copper nanocluster modified grafted titanium dioxide, it comes to the complete decomposition soon. And one of the most famous and the most studied visible uh, light sensitive photocatalyst is nitrogen doped titanium dioxide. This is the case for raised oxidation power, well, no, balance band. Okay, as I told, when we raise balance band, oxidation power is decreased. That's why complete decomposition is rather difficult. But in our case, the, we can easily decompose. We did not sacrifice the oxidation power. What happens, to make the long story short, Okay, this is due to, this new band is due to the interfacial chi transfer. The balance band electron is excited to the divalent copper or trivalent ion cluster. 
forming monovalent kappa or divalent ion. And monovalent kappa, divalent, monovalent kappa or divalent kappa will be reacting with oxygen with two electron reactions forming hydrogen power oxide. So this electron is consumed by these two electron reactions and the strong oxidation, the valence band holes with strong oxidation power is remained. That's why it works under visible light illumination. And uh, more interestingly, this one, especially divalent kappa modified titanium dioxide has very, very, very strong antibacterial and antiviral activities. This is experimental data, E. coli bacteria. This is influenza virus of uh, influenza virus case. And activity decreases in the case of virus under the visible light illumination. 10 minutes illumination decreases the activity five orders of magnitude. The reason is, by the illumination of this chai transfer band of divalent kappa, monovalent kappa species is produced. And monovalent kappa is known to have very strong such an antibacterial, antivirus effect. However, monovalent kappa is not stable under the ambient conditions. That's why it cannot be used. But as I told, we can produce by such a photoillumination. That's why the certain amount of monovalent kappa always exists on the surface. So it has such a very strong antibacterial, antivirus effect. This is a field test at public space, actually in a uh, uh, hospital toilet, bathrooms. And, uh, before, before using our coating system, they had uh, about uh, 500 bacteria, so number of bacteria in okay, 100 square centimeters or something like that. But after coating the, the walls with our newly developed catalytic paint, drastically number, number of the bacteria drastically decreased like that. Inhibition ratio is more than 95%. So we did such a demonstration test in various fields, and it works very well, even in, uh, indoors. Of course, even outdoors, no problem. But even indoors, indoors light intensity, okay, we have enough visible light, and the visible light creates monovalent copper. That's why it works very well. So now that the films interior panels, glasses, ceramic tiles, or hand rails are being produced by the industry, start, start commercialization recently. So I showed that uh, this one, but uh, that will be expanded like that. This is my hope in the near future. OK, so this is the first topic which I experienced. And, uh, I closed my laboratory three years ago and moved to NIMS as a president. So now my job is management, not experiment anymore. However, based on my experience, the, I'm trying to tell the, my experience to the members of NIMS. That's really interesting. What the most important point is, okay, I started very, very basic scientist, actually. And uh, basic science is very interesting. I wrote many papers, and papers are cited. I'm very happy. That is also interesting. But uh, when we see, when I see the product which I developed in town, that much, much more. Ha I'm, I feel much, much happier. Okay. So doing basic science is very important, and uh, based on our own basic science, if we can produce some new applications, that makes me happier. So why don't you think about uh, you know, the, your, your key point of the basic science result to some application to society? That is the point I'm always telling to my researchers. Let me explain 
introduce a bit about NIMS. NIMS was established only the 18 years ago by merging two national institutes, Institute of Metals and Institute of Inorganic Metals. So we started from hard materials, but uh, after the establishment of NIMS, we invited many soft matter scientists. So now we cover all the areas of materials, of materials, okay. And uh, totally we have 1,600 people and ha half of them, about 800 uh, researchers, and half of this eight, eight hundred, uh, half of this 800, nearly 400 are tenured. Okay. Tsuku By the way, Tsukuba is located very close to Tokyo. Okay. And uh, the Thomson Reuters reported the global ranking of global ranking of government governmental institution. And we, NIMS, is ranked in 12th here. And we are the only uh, institute, only material research institute in this ranking. So our mission is, of course, doing the fundamental scientific and engineering research, of course. But in addition to that, we are expected to do the, trans the technology transfer of this result to the industry for society. So our research center, we have seven research centers, structures, materials, functional materials, magnetic spectroscopic materials, energy environment materials, and advanced material analysis and material informatics, something like that. And those are mission-oriented research. But uh, they have to do the mission-oriented research, but effort ratio of half of the effort ratio can be used for their own curiosity driven research too. In other words, half of their working hour is has to be used for the mission oriented research, but the other half can be used as they like. Okay. And uh, very unique center is this MANA. MANA's mission is bottom up basic research. So the member of the MANA can use their whole working hour to their own basic research. The curiosity driven research. So, and the MANAS member is one quarter of the total research members, so something like, like that. So, I show, first I show several examples of the materials we developed and transferred to the industry. The first one is nickel based single crystal alloy for refractory materials. The, this is super refractory materials, and the nickel alloy nickel-based and plus 13 different alloy elements are added and having the, high, the, the world best refractory materials we, have, we developed, he developed. And uh, this is used for turbine blade of jet engine and Boeing 787 is used. Actually, this one is technology transfer, technology transfer was done to Rolls-Royce by licensing and uh, collaborations. Because the com combustion temperature can be raised, the combustion efficiency is increased, decreasing the uh, uh, fuel cost. About, I heard that one, about one million dollars fuel cost is reduced per plane every year, something like that. So material is so powerful. The second example is the iron-based shape memory alloy for damping materials. We Japan have, unfortunately, have, have the earthquake very frequently. And it is known that the, the, in the case of big earthquake, after the main quake was followed by many after quakes. That's why this is used this one is used for damping material of the building, materials of the building. And uh, fatigue life is really important because once a earthquake uh, occurs, then aftershock is coming. So because we are, the, he developed, this guy developed the, the shape memory alloy damping materials, that's why the fatigue life is increased drastically. And this one is technically transferred to Japanese major general constructor. And uh, the, second second, the second building 
was the built very recently, and that was that technology will be used from now on. Another ex example and another material is this one. This is the fluorescent silica alumina oxynitride. It is said cyan for high brightness at high temperature, and this is used for the phosphor of LED, blue LED excitation. The, in the case of LED phosphor, the phosphor is directly painted on LED. That's why temperature is increasing. You know that the fluorescence efficiency is generally decreasing by increasing the temperature. That's why we have to have the highly efficient phosphor at high temperature. The idea is used Cyron. Cyron is used for high temperature refractory materials. Of course, not fluorescent. That's why we introduced the fluorescence iron, like a European, to the Cyron. And uh, this is a high temperature refractory material. That's why structure is not changed, hardly changed, by increasing the temperature. That's why even at the high temperature, fluorescence efficiency is maintained. And this is used in the world. The market share is 10% in volume terms and 30% in value terms. And he get the license. Of course, Nimus get the license, but the inventor also get the license. He's the richest in our institute, richest person. Much, much richer than I, of course. And uh, magnetic material for ultra high density recording and uh, both writing and reading. And this is not, those are not uh, the uh, commercialized yet, but uh, this one is now industrial prototype for new uh, next generation, uh, next generation hard disks, collaborating with world top class hard, hard disk drive companies. And also we are developing the medical materials of like, uh, uh, this one, uh, hydroxy apatite with collagen forming self organized nanostructure with spongy like viscoelasticity. So that can be, this can be restored, uh, re resolved, followed by bone formation. And uh, this is also licensed and collaborating with Japanese companies and market share is 5%. He's not so rich yet. <laughs> and also, this is fish gelatin. By using fish gelatin modified hydrophobically can be used for tissue adhesive uh, uh, surgical species for surgical operations. And preclinical pre tests will start this year collaborating with medical school and industry. He will become rich soon, <laughs> not yet. Okay, all those examples are the materials. We develop the materials and transfer those materials, the functional materials to industry. This is a way, one of the way for the technology transfer. This is something like that to cultivate the foodstuffs and that, that food stuff is given to the chef, good chef. Okay, this is a way which NIMS did. Because NIMS is a material institute, that's why this is a direct, this is a way. But uh, recently we decided to go forward one step. Why don't, you, that, why don't we cook by ourselves? Okay, to fabricate device, even at the material research center, research laboratory. So we built a nanofabrication platform, rather huge, uh, rather large clean room, and uh, deposition etching, annealing area, lithography area, and process evaluation area, something like that. Like that. Anyway, now we can use, we, the, when we have new materials, we can have a chance to 
use it and uh, to fabricate a new device. It's a way to encourage the researcher to do the interdisciplinary directions. Actually, the many people are trying like that. This is one of the examples. This is one is a, okay, this guy recently developed the metal nanoparticles like uh, silver, copper, and gold are coordinated with the pi, pi conjugated ligand. Then they have the conductive ink. An important point is even without annealing at the room temperature drying, very, very high conductivity is obtained. And uh, the resolution is very high, world highest, one micron. And by using that the fabrication system, he, the fabricator TFT on paper or even on leaves, like that. So he is, oh. OK. He established uh, startups the last year. He has not been rich yet, but he's trying hard to do this using this, the startups. The second example is electrochromic polymers. This guy succeeded to get the supramolecular polymer with including metals, OK, like this. And uh, this metal can be electrochemically you know, the reduced or oxidized. We can change the valency of metal electrochemically. So we can have the electrochromic materials. Very important point is by using these polymers, the, it shows very, very high durability against coloring and decoloring. And also, the coloring efficiency is very high. As for the chrom electrochromic materials, tungsten trioxide is already used. But the efficiency is much higher. This one, the efficiency is higher than tungsten trioxide. And more interestingly, by changing of the metals from iron to, from iron to cobalt or ruthenium, various colors can be obtained. So electro, new electrochromic materials. And actually, he fabricated, he fabricated such a, you know, the light control glass with different colors like this. He will, he has not, but he will establish the venture, startup venture soon this year. OK. So by encouraging the people to do the device, so many people are trying to they establish the startup company. That's interesting for me. Next example is atomic switches. In the case of conventional semiconductor switch, we control the semiconductor carrier concentration for on and off. This is a conventional switch. But the atomic switch we developed is instead of carrier concentration control, the, we try to change to try to control the atomic movement. This is on, this is off. So atomic movement of silver, usually. So advantage, oh, OK. And uh, advantage of this one is that uh, the, in, in this case, the charged particle, charged electron and holes are created. That's why those are really, generally speaking, sensitive to the, the electromagnetic noise or radiation. But in these atomic switches, it's really strong against such an electromagnetic noise or something like that. So the, we collaborated with NEC. NEC is the electric company in Japan. And recently, this is commercialized as a field pro programmable, programmable gate arrays. And this is licensing to NEC. And one more example is the inorganic nanosheets. The, one of our researchers uh, de this developed the method to have the, such a two-dimensional nanosheet by the very simple 
lay, uh, solution process. Ex exfoliation of layered compound by a massive swelling system. Anyway, those, all those processes are done in solution process simply. And the, he can have a fi uh, the thickness of a few atoms, one, and the lateral size is one, um, 10 microns or something like that. And uh, by this method, he can, pro he can uh, synthesize various, various metal organic species. Interesting point is that these nanoseeds can be used to tailor the nanostructures with rich varieties like Lego-like games. So by the combination of ferromagnetic and uh, uh, non-magnetic one, then ferromagnetic super lattice can be easily obtained or superconducting and magnetic or uh, nano sheet and organic one or something like that. Anyway, such a rich varieties of layers can be formed by very simple method. And one of the examples is this one, directly nanoform, uh, nanofilm. Okay, this calcium, sodium, neobate, by controlling the layer, number of layers, the, we succeed to have very, very high the dielectric films. And this one is transferred to the license to Samsung, and now Samsung is working hard for the commercialization. In addition to such uh, the electric fabrication system, we also built the battery research platform. In the battery uh, research platform, the super drive room is really essential, with green room, of course, and with super dry room, the battery fabrication and analysis can be done under the airtight sample transfer conditions. That's very important. So in this uh, super dry rooms, various you know, the instruments are in. So airtight transfer can be, analysis can be done. So we can fabricate the battery and analyze the battery and th by using those systems. The first example, the, which uh, is developed in this uh, room is graphene stack species. And uh, in this case, carbon nanotube was used as a spacer of graphene. Then the, diffu the diffusion pathway can be made. So diffusion pathway make all the graphene surface accessible to lithium ion, for example. And she fabricated the supercapacitor by using this the material. And interestingly, this the graphene supercapacitor is power density is higher, both power density and energy density is higher than the conventional one. And compared to the lithium ion batteries, yes, the energy density is a bit smaller, one order of magnitude, but of course power density is very high. So that's why this has very unique character. She also established the startup venture last year. And uh, many companies are now coming to use her system. And second example is the next generation secondary battery, all solid state batteries. All solid state battery is expected to be replaced with conventional lithium ion batteries. However, although the energy density of the all solid battery is equivalent to the lithium, conventional commercial lithium batteries, but the power density is much, much lower than commercial lithium battery. This is a very, very big problem. And we analyzed the reason with basic research method, especially at the interface, then we found that unusually high resistance exists, exists in between lithium cobalt electrode and between lithium cobalt oxide electrode and solid electrolyte interface. So, and to make the long story short, we got one of the researchers got the idea to introduce the buffer layer in between this positive 
and positive electrode and uh, solid, solid uh, electrolyte. Actually, lithium titanium oxide buffer layer with uh, few nanometers thickness is introduced. Then, then the power density increased drastically and exceeded the commercial lithium batteries. So, we have very excellent patent for next generation batteries. Still, next generation solid state battery is not commercialized. But once it is commercialized, all the company has to pay to NIMS, maybe. And the last example I show is a lithium air battery. You may know that. Lithium air battery is called ultimate secondary battery. This is because this is known to have the highest theoretical energy density. However, there are many, many problems. But the two big problems are the low charge discharge performance, and also it is really weak to hide in the water and impurity water and CO2 as a, the side reaction. For this first problem, we developed a new electrolyte by combinatorial method and uh, charging and discharging property is increasing. Now 50 times, or well, not 100 times yet, but nearly 100 times we can have repeat. However, still much, much lower than expected. When we use this one to the Vifco, uh, the cycling number is expected to be more than 10,000 or several 10,000. So much, much more, much, much better system is necessary. However, recently we know that we started the collaboration with SoftBank. SoftBank is the Japanese biggest carrier com communication carrier companies. And they have a plan, plan to fly new flying body in a stratosphere as the relay, relay Relay place, relay, relay spot of the internet. Okay, so, and this area, no water and no CO2. So we don't have to worry about side reaction. Of course, no oxygen. That's why you have to carry the oxygen to here. And more importantly, the cycling and the pump. The charge and the discharge performance required for this application is only several hundred times, much, much lower than the BFQ's case. Several hundred times, yes, we can do. And we do not have to consider about such you know, the side reaction. Then we have a chance to achieve this one. So we started the collaboration, big, big collaboration. We got big money, collaboration money with the, this, the companies. And uh, I hope that we can develop the lithium air batteries for this purpose in the near future. Anyway, those are the ones which the NIMUS is doing. And as I showed, the NIMUS go ahead, go forward, not only the materials, but fabrication of the devices and the new directions we started. I really hope to have the collaboration with Win. OK, I have to finish. Uh, I, because I don't have time, I skip it. Anyway, last year, we assigned the collaboration agreement, Win and NIMS. And we started a new collaborative program, graduate program, uh, with, uh, among Win and NIMS. And that collaborative Collaboration program is very good, you know. Collaborative program, then student, graduate student can come to stay in NIMS the, the half year or at most one year. And we provide the financial support, living expenses, and also accommodation, very, very good accommodation we have. And uh, you can do the PhD work at NIMS. Of course, the main, the main supervisor is the professor here, Wins. 
and the NIMS researcher serves as the advisor. And uh, you can do a part, part of your PhD work in NIMS by using various top-notch facilities. We have various top-notch facilities at NIMS. For example, we recently introduced the 800 megahertz wide wall solid state NMR. This is very expensive, 7 million US dollars, something like that. But we recently, and the others, all of those are introduced very recently. We are really good equipped. So you can use, you have a chance to use when you stay here using this program. In addition to that, we have various material databases, inorganic, polymers, metals, and alloys. And we are increasing this database. So in the collaboration with FINS, you have a chance to use this database too. So let me close my talk by showing this one. OK, I started this one. I started my talk showing this one. This is the picture of Tokyo. And uh, this is a sky tree, the tallest tower in the world. But uh, the, what I want to show is this one, this river. This is the Sumida River flowing in the downtown of Tokyo, very clean. However, this is a picture of Sumida River 50 years ago. So, so dirty. And now, just from the same spot and the same direction, the picture like this, so different. OK, now what we learned is, OK, humanity caused environmental pollution, but uh, we cleaned by technology. So technology is really important and powerful. I really hope to produce new technology by the collaboration with you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. I have a stupid question. Uh, in addition to TiO2, can you have, for example, zinc oxide with the same properties? OK, so we tried various the semiconductors. And titanium dioxide is the best. Zinc oxide works. But the zinc oxide shows the corrosion oh. yeah, in the water. And not so the. Uh, the durability not so strong against uh, humidity. So that's why the performance of titanium dioxide is much better than zinc oxide. And that is unique in that, uh, for this application? Okay, we tried, but uh, zinc oxide is not so good for these applications. Yeah. Because of the low durability. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. I always thought this uh, titanium dioxide, I mean, if you illuminate, the uh, organic contamination is kind of, of decomposed, so that this is the effect. But you show it's, it's really an inorganic effect, even without hydrocarbons around. Is that true? Or could hydrocarbon contamination also play a role? OK. For so super hydrophilicity, you are talking about. Yeah, oh, yeah hy hydrophilicity. switch between hydrophobic and hydrophilic. OK, so this is the one which people think. But it's not true, because our, the, what we are doing, the experiment, what we are using is ambient conditions. That's why the organic contaminant always comes. That's why even if we illuminate for a long time, we cannot clean up the organic compound at all. Always a certain amount of organic compound remains. And actually, even if we illuminate with rather strong UV light, the concentration of organ compound can be decreased only a half or something like that. Yeah, that's why that is not the case for this one. Actually, as you suggested, if we can completely decompose the organic compound on the surface, then it becomes hydrophilic. Yeah, but uh, this, not that this is the case. Yeah, at yeah, that point, we got the argument with the surface scientists for a long time. They did the experiment at the, with the high vacuum conditions and illuminate. Then they can clean up the surface perfectly. So they said they insisted that's the reason why superhydrophilicity is obtained. But in reality, as I told, 
when we illuminate under the ambient conditions, we cannot get such a you know, clean surface. Ha, ha, ha. And then supposedly the answer is the kitchen. Um, are there other applications in the like kitchen arena that we could use? Um, yeah, of course. That, is it available? And yes, of course, available. Available. Yeah, because uh, we produce not, not me, but the company produced various you know, materials, so pe including paint. So that will be commercialized soon. Oh, indeed. Yeah. So right now, like in the kitchen, it's still not like if things can just get cleaned on its own. Uh, you, are, you, you are talking about the sink? Like the, all the, yeah, working there. In the case of sink, that is made of metal. That's why, um, for the moment, we don't have the material to call the sink. Um, yeah, we can, but uh, not so big market, I think, because uh, the company decides which one they apply. But anyway, paint, coating paint can be you know, commercialized soon. Yeah. Sorry, I forgot. Which form of TiO2 are you using? Pardon? Rutile or anatase? OK, so for the UV light illumination, anatase is better. And for visible light illumination in our newly developed one, rutile is better. I don't know the reason why. I don't know. Mm. And the things you make is with the pure uh, anatase or rutile, or these are mixed in a commercial way? Okay, in the commercial things, the pure anatas for the outdoors and the pure rutile for indoor use. Yes. We tried various titanium dioxide materials. And, uh, okay, not only the purities, but various other you know, factors influence the activities. Mm. But uh, generally speaking, in those cases, the pure rutile is better than the others. And, uh, for outdoor use, pure anatas is better than others. Yeah. Let's uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.